Hello and welcome to the first episode of the Criterion Quarter with your host, Peter Garrett. Now, for my first, for my inaugural episode, I decided to do the 1954 Japanese classic, Godzilla, directed by Ishiro Honda. Now... Some people asked me why I wanted to start with a movie like Godzilla, because it's people think Godzilla, they just think cheesy monster movie, you know, guy in a suit, destroying sets and, and models and, you know, bad English dubbing where it's, it's a big joke. But what people don't understand is how a lot of, God, the first Godzilla movie actually had a lot of social commentary in it. It was, it was, a, very, it was a very rich film with subtext. And that was actually one of the reasons it became such a big hit in Japan. So I thought, and you know, people know about Godzilla. It's a movie that, pe that people have heard about, even if you've never seen any of them. I mean, the film series is over 60 years old. We just had the most recent film come out two years ago, which was in a, you know, an American version. So it's a, it's a, it's a pop culture stalwart. So I figured, hey, and you know, and I love the fact that Criterion released the first film because, again, it just shows you how how widely varied their library is. So hopefully, you know, I can tell you a little bit about the movie, and it might give you a little more of an understanding of of how it's it is it is actually a really good film. So the plot of Godzilla is as follows: It's after several fishing boats are sunk under mysterious circumstances and an island village is destroyed a research expedition discovers that the cause is this giant 165 foot monster that the villagers call gojira and they find out that or it's thought that the monster came the the rampaging of the monster was a result of it being disturbed from its hibernation and slumber in the earth through H-bomb testing and that it was H-bomb it was the H-bomb that essentially is the cause of it coming on land and, and wreaking all this havoc and in the course of the film you have a contingent of people that just want want to destroy the monster and just rid of it but then you have the main scientist character played by Takashi Shimura who is a legendary Japanese actor who wants to study it and ha doesn't want to just destroy it outright because he thinks it's important for it to be studied. So you have the the differing sides where Shimura's character represents science and wanting to observe and learn, whereas most of the other people are over the more military. Let's destroy this because it's it's wreaking so much. So and the film, yeah, the film is basically what you'd expect i mean it is you know it is a guy in a suit and it is models and and everything like that but again th what makes the film such an interesting movie when you when you think about it from certain perspectives is how you're able to how the monster is almost a, a manifestation of the japanese people's fears and anger at the time because the time when the movie came out in 1954 they were still they weren't even 10 years removed from the end of World War II, most of, you know, a lot of Japan was in, you know, was in ruins. And actually in the film, there's several, there are several references to Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki and the, and, and the atomic bombs. And it's interesting how Godzilla in, ja in the Japanese culture, from, from what I understand, is not looked at as a villain. He's not looked at as the monster. I mean, honestly, he's almost... He, I mean, in, in the later films, he became more of a hero of fighting off other monsters. But in this film, he almost was looked at as an anti-hero because in, in the film, he's, you know, he's destroying all these buildings and, and cities. And at one point, though, he destroys the Japanese government building, the, the Diet Building. And... From from what I understand, when that happened in the film, audiences would cheer because they were so disillusioned with the government at that time because they blamed the government for getting them into a war and, you know, that war leading to all the, the destruction that Japanese had, that Japan had suffered at that time. And mind you, granted, my, my, my opinions are my opinions. I might be wrong, so obviously I'm sure I'll get comments from people saying that I'm 
mistaken in some things, but I, I get, you know, but the, the beauty about art is that interpretation is a subject, is a subjective thing. So anyway, so continuing on with, with the film, um, it's interesting how Godzilla, again, has this meaning. And, and so, you know, I was, I'm talking again, talking about the, the DVD here because I personally per, like DVDs still, I still love DVDs. And one of the reasons I love DVDs is because you get special features with them, which some, some stuff on some digital stuff like iTunes will give you some extras, but DVDs still are able to pack a lot more extra stuff because I like, I love how you can learn from the extra features. So one of the features of the DVD is a, an audio commentary by, uh, David Callat, who is actually a big Godzilla expert and enthusiast. So he is able to give a whole lot more information on the film and, and what happens and, and a lot of things going on that, you know, some, some stories and anecdotes about the movie, which is, which is interesting again, because I love how it, because it, it, it adds more dimension in my mind to the, to the film is when you learn more about it. So, and so that's really cool. And then another thing that I really liked is another special feature is you're actually given the American recut version of Godzilla, which was called Godzilla King of the Monsters. And Godzilla King of the Monsters came out in 1956 with starring Raymond Burr as an American journalist who's in Tokyo at the time that Godzilla shows up. So basically the American version is is very similar to the Japanese version, but they cut out a few scenes from the Japanese version, replacing it with new scenes that were made for for the American version. And 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 you know you've got the you've got some of the bad dubbing. They they kept actually a more Japanese language in it than I thought they would, which was interesting. So you've got so you've got that, but to see it from an American perspective was is you know it, it's definitely not as good as the original but it's an, it's an interesting twist on on the original film to see it from a different perspective and actually one of the one of the biggest differences is in the Japanese version there's several allusions made to the United States in a not flattering way so as you can imagine the American version cut those scenes out like for instance there's a scene in the in the original film that has uh, government officials and citizens arguing on whether or not they should tell the public about the monster and, 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 you know, what caused it. And, but the government doesn't want to because they don't want to risk upsetting trade, they call them trade partners in the movie, but it's supposed to reference the United States. And again, at the time, they didn't, you know, United, the United States was a, was a new partner for them in, in world relations and economics and trade and stuff like that. So, uh, basically saying that the United, you know, that the United States is partially responsible for that. And again, so in the, the American version, that's all gone. It's just kind of a, it's just a straight monster movie. And what, what's cool is how, you know, the film holds up and it was enjoyed so much because yeah, kids saw it and they it was just it was a monster movie to them. It was just a fun, exciting monster movie. But for adults, when they saw that, when they were able to see the social commentary, they were able to see that this film was addressing concerns and issues. That's what made them connect to the film, and that's actually the beauty of science fiction in general. And that's why a lot of people use science fiction as a means to observe and examine social issues. Because, say, before this, it also a, 19, a classic 1950s sci-fi movie is The Day the Earth Stood Still, which was, about, which was another element of uh, dealing with the idea of, of war, you know, nuclear power and, and destructive capabilities. And so what's cool is just how in science fiction, they've, over the years, they've realized that you can teach and make people think about things without directly referencing it. And co potentially being controversial with it. So if it's a movie, it's not. If it's a monster movie, yeah, nobody cares. They'll be distracted by the monster stuff. But if you look hard enough, you can see the subtext, and that's when good filmmakers and good storytellers are able to infuse that. So, and actually, there's a character in the film. His name is Serizawa, and he talks about you know how you know the weapons of mass destruction. 
because he's created another one. It's in the film, it's called the Oxygen Destroyer, which is a little silly, but you know, it's still, it's still, you know, the, the point of it being though is that he says he does not want anybody to know about it because he knows that once the government or the military finds out about something that he's created that has that kind of destruct, d destructive capabilities, that it will lead to more weapons of mass destruction. So in essence, Serizawa is almost a surrogate in the film for the scientist and engineer J. Robert Oppenheimer, who was on the Manhattan Project, who helped develop the atomic bomb during World War II. And in the course of that project, Oppenheimer was known as quoting from an ancient text where he said, now I have, now I'm, now I'm become death, the destroyer of worlds. So it shows this evidence of this inventor regretting the invention and wishes he can, he could have, he could uninvent it because he understands that what he's done is going to cause a lot, you know, this, this, this incredible amount of destruction, which that element is in the movie. So there's a lot of interesting things in the film that I, I, I really think adds a lot more to it than just it being your straight, you know, monster film. So anyway, I hope now... All of, so here, here's the here's the box one more time for Godzilla. Hey, and so all of these all of these films you can get on criteria or most of them you know you, you can find you can buy on most websites. You can go to Criterion's website, which I'll put a link to, and actually you can watch a lot of Criterion films on Hulu, which is cool. So if you have a Hulu Plus account, you can you can watch a lot of these movies. I still recommend the DVDs mainly because you get special features, and I it's just personal choice for me. But I I hope that you've enjoyed this first episode, and I hope that you join me for future episodes of the Criterion Corner. And thank you very much.